Good morning, church. As Pastor Peter pointed out, we are continuing our series. We are continuing our series on the Epistle of James. Uh, When Pastor Chua spoke last week, he kicked us off. He talked about the uh, trials and the value of trials for the development of faith and character. And he also talked about the fact that we need godly wisdom, not the wisdom of this world, but godly wisdom in order to overcome trials. This week, I'll continue our series uh, on James, looking at the subject, at the topic of temptation. But I want to begin, first of all, with an analogy of how temptation can penetrate our defenses. In a book uh, by an author, uh, Bill Perkins, he wrote a book called When Good Men Are Tempted. He writes about an attack on a British uh, warship in the Falklands. During the war in the Falklands, the British Royal Navy felt that its ships were safe from attack because of the sophisticated defense systems that identified enemy missiles and shot them down. Attack after attack was repelled without any damage to a British ship. And then the unexpected happened. The Royal Navy's 3,500-ton destroyer, HMS Sheffield, was sunk by a single missile fired from an Argentine fighter jet. Almost as soon as the destroyer hit the ocean floor, critics began to wonder if modern surface warships were obsolete sitting ducks for today's smart missiles. A bigger surprise came when an investigation revealed that the Sheffield's defences did pick up the incoming missile. The ship's computer correctly identified it as a French Exocet missile. But the computer was programmed to ignore Exocets as friendly. The computer didn't recognize that the missile had been fired from an enemy plane. The ship was sunk by a missile that it saw coming, a missile it could have destroyed. When I reflect over that story, I find it quite remarkable that when we are tempted, we have a way of lessening the potential danger that that temptation poses. Sometimes we even convince ourselves that that temptation isn't really much of a temptation at all. It's no problem. I can handle it. I'm not a new Christian. I've dealt with that kind of problem before. These are the kind of thoughts that some people have when temptation comes. What amazes me also is deep down, in spite of our mental ability to lessen the potential danger of a temptation, there's something deep within us, something within us which is conscious of the fact that if we toy with temptations, there will be consequences. That's why I think God gave us a conscience that can feel guilt. It's our internal mechanism for recognizing that wrong is wrong. No matter how we paint it, no matter how we try to change the way it looks or the way it feels, something within us recognizes that when we have done wrong, it is wrong. For example, in Psalm 38 verse 4, King David was forced to acknowledge that his guilt had overwhelmed him like a burden too heavy to bear. Now, Scripture doesn't say exactly what he did, but whatever he did, conscience, his conscience couldn't deny the fact that he had done something wrong. It was just too heavy for him to bear. The aim of my message today is to prepare you for temptation's attack. You need to recognize that temptation, uh, so you need to recognize temptation for what it really is, rather 
than uh, what we mentally try to think that it is. You need to see temptation in all its power, in all its force, so that we don't treat it like something small and insignificant. It has the power to impact us even as an Exocet missile. Let's turn in our Bibles now to James chapter 1. We're going to continue uh, our key text of the book of James and we're going to read from verses 12 to 18. I'm reading from the New King James. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his, of his creatures. From this, sorry, from this passage, from this portion of scripture, what I'm going to do, I'm going to pick out what I believe are five keys for preparing you for dealing with temptation's attack. Five keys that will help you to deal with temptation's attack. Key number one, we see it in verse 12. Key number one, you need to recognize that everyone is tempted. Everyone is tempted. Verse 12 begins, blessed is the man who endures temptation. From this statement, blessed is the man who endures temptation, we can deduce that temptation is not just something that is experienced by those who are weak, but also by those who are able to endure it. Otherwise, the scripture wouldn't say, blessed are those who endure temptation. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul writes, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man, common to all of us. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Paul doesn't say if you are tempted. He says when you are tempted. Which means that every one of us is exposed to temptation. Every one of us is capable of being tempted. It happens to us all. In fact, Scripture also shows us if you can't be convinced by anything else, you need to be convinced by this, that Jesus Christ himself was tempted. And if he was tempted, then what say you? I'm not suggesting that because it happens to us all, therefore we shouldn't care about it, we shouldn't think about it. Quite the opposite. Because temptation happens to us all, we need to be vigilant especially for attacks that seem as harmless as an Exocet missile. We need to be vigilant. Key number two, recognize that God doesn't tempt. Verse 13 categorically states that God doesn't tempt anyone. You know what this means? It means that God is not the problem since God doesn't tempt. God allows us to go through temptations even though he is not the cause. 
Because like trials, temptations are another means of developing faith and character. So what is the difference then? What is the difference between a temptation and a trial? If both temptations and trials develop our faith and character, why doesn't God use temptations? Well, the difference is in the intention. The purpose of a trial is to prove uh, to you what God already knows. God already knows what you're like. He already knows what you're capable of. And if God allows you to enter into a particular trial, it is because he wants you to know what he already knows. As Pastor Chua shared last week, you don't know how strong tea is until you put it in a little bit of hot water. In the same way, you don't know what you are capable of until you face a little struggle. So trials prove to you what God already knows. The purpose of temptation, however, is to corrupt. It is evil in its origin. Like a trial, a temptation is difficult to overcome. But unlike a trial, a temptation is not designed for you to overcome it. It's not designed for you to succeed. That's why God doesn't tempt. As I read earlier, God won't even allow you to endure more than you are able to handle. He will provide a way out for you. Even if you, if you are struggling with it, he will provide a way out so that you can continue to stand. God does not want you to be corrupted and destroyed as a result of temptation. So who is the source, the inspiration behind all temptations, who desires to see the downfall of men? Matthew 4, 1 quite clearly tells us that the tempter is the devil. Key number three. Recognize temptation's destination. In verse 14, James reminds us that we are tempted when we are drawn away by our own desires and enticed. Yes, the enticement comes from the devil, but the desire to give in to the temptation, that is within us. It is within you. The desire to lay hold of that temptation is within your own heart. Know that it is within your heart to be lured into sin, particularly the sins that most appeal to your inner desires. Let me use myself as an example. I'm not a violent man. I've never had a fight. Yes, I can say that. In all my, what am I, 43 years now, I have never had a fight. I've never had the rest, the red mist descend, descend over my eyes. I've never felt compelled to fight someone or hit someone. I shared last year about something that happened probably around this time last year, actually, when there was a lot of snow. There were a bunch of lads. As I was driving on my way home, there were a bunch of lads who were standing on the corner of a street. And one of them jumped out into the road and tried to stop me. I thought something serious had happened. So I slowed the car down. I wanted to see if there was some way that I could help. And then all of the other guys started pelting snowballs at my car. Now, I did not realize at that moment that's what they were doing. I just heard the thud and felt the thud of the snowballs as they hit the car. In that moment, I felt anger. Was I furious? Yes. Was I tempted towards violence? Initially, no but I did want to retaliate. In my mind, I made up different ways of how I could retaliate. But also in my mind, there is a default thought 
This thought has entered my mind in uh, maybe, I think, the last uh, five or six years since I've uh, been part of the pastoral team of the church. And the thought is, if I were to retaliate, what would happen if one of the people out there, if I were to do something that was wrong, what would happen if one of the people there happened to be a member of my church? I have to be honest. And so I thought to myself, I really want to retaliate. I really want to impact. I want them to feel how they made me feel. But then after that, as I drove away, God began to speak to me and minister to my heart. And God began to show me about the need for this world to experience the love of God. Not eye for an eye, not anger for anger but to return hate with love. And that began to minister to my heart. Even I remember God saying to me, Colin, you need to pray blessing over them. And I remember how I struggled to do that. But God gave me the courage and the strength to do that. And I started to pray blessing over those who really made me feel angry. As the snow began to fall, again last week I was driving along the road (laughs) and I saw this little boy playing at the side of the road I didn't really pay him much attention I just saw the fact that he was there and then the next thing he turned around and went (laughs) and the snowball landed right in my windscreen thud it brought up all the feelings again all the negative feelings again but you know what my initial reaction was not anger it was not that I wanted to retaliate my initial uh, feeling at that moment was I think history is going to repeat itself again that same day in the evening I saw the same lads who were standing on the corner of the road last year and they were there again in the same spot. (laughs) The first thought that came into my mind is I'm not slowing down for anybody and if somebody gets in the way I'm putting the foot down on the accelerator. That was the first thought. I had to confess, I'm confessing now. And they did the same thing. They started pelting snowballs at the car. How do you think I felt at that moment? What do you think I was tempted to do? The enticement to sin, I believe, comes not just from those lads, but through the devil motivating them. I don't think they knew what they were doing. I think they just thought they were having fun. But I think that this is how the devil uses situations because he wants to entice a reaction. The enticement to sin, I believe, came from the devil. But the desire to retaliate came from my own heart. The desire to give like with like, to respond back to them in the way that they responded to me, that came from within the heart. Why is it important for us to understand this? I can't change. You can't change what the devil does. You can't change how the devil will entice you. Even Jesus was tempted by the devil. You can't change the devil enticing you. But you can change the way that you respond by dealing with what's in your own heart. In James chapter 4 verse 7, later on, we'll probably come back to this passage again, but in James chapter 4 verse 7, James writes, resist the devil. You resist. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. It's a scripture we used to quote a lot when I was growing up in church. Resist the devil and he will flee. But you know, there came a point where I suddenly thought to myself, but how? How are we to resist the devil. We're not just talking about your average Joe, we're talking about the devil. How are we to resist him? We will come to that later. Key 
Number four, recognize that temptation is a seed that grows. Verse 15 tells us that when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. In this verse, James takes us through the stages of life from conception to adulthood and then death. But notice firstly that before sin is conceived, there is just desire. Before any sin is committed, there is desire. What's the significance of that? You are not a sinner because you desire to sin. It is not the desire to sin that makes you a sinner. It is when you act on those desires that sin is birthed. There may be a negative thought, but it's when you act on that thought that you have now given birth to sin. It doesn't mean that you leave the desires in your heart untouched because the desire cannot uh, be acted upon if it is not there in your own heart. Some people may appear to be most holy, pure, and spotless. But know that everyone has sinful desires. Everyone. I'm reminded, I might have shared this before, I'm reminded of something that happened in my sister's church. There was somebody who was uh, speaking on the subject, I think also of temptation. And during the time that they were speaking, they said, look, I, I feel the Lord speaking right now. I feel that the Lord is going to make somebody manifest, somebody begin to move, who is filled with all these ungodly negative thoughts. At that moment, everybody was like this. Of course, nobody wants to move. But the point is that every one of us has sinful desires. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. It doesn't matter what you want people to think about you. Every one of us have had sinful desires. The second thing to notice is that even after the sin has been birthed, you don't immediately suffer the consequences of death. The scripture tells us that the sin keeps growing through to adulthood. And when it has matured, then it results in death. This shows me that even in sin, there is still hope. I might have given birth to sin by acting on my desires, but it is not yet fully grown. What does it mean that sin is fully grown? It is fully grown when it masters you. It is fully grown when it begins to take control of your life. That's what an adult does. An adult takes responsibility for the way that they live. And when that sin is fully grown, it begins to take responsibility for the way that you live. It influences you in a way that leads you to the point where you say, I can't change. I don't know what to do. This thing has gripped my heart. In Genesis 4, 7, God made the same point to Cain before he succumbed to the temptation to kill his brother. God said, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. You must master it. Do not let sin master you. Do not let sin grow up in your life where it becomes an adult, where it takes responsibility over the way that you live. But even before then, don't let sin be conceived by acting on your desires. Now this is easy to say. But when your desires meet the devil's enticement, it's almost humanly impossible to break the attraction. How do you resist the devil? How do you break that connection, that enticement? Key number five, 
recognize that only the truth sets you free. Only the truth will set you free. In verses 16 to 18 of our text, James takes the time to explain something about the nature of God. He is the giver of good gifts and the most perfect gift of all, that of Jesus Christ. He is the father of heavenly lights, that is the creator of the sun, the stars and the galaxies. And because he's the father, it means he cares for his creation. He sees those who have been changed through the word of truth as the first fruit of all creation. That is, he sees those who have been changed by his word as the best of all things. It also goes on to say, and he doesn't change. There is no shadow of turning in him. Why is this important? James builds up to this point because there were some who were mistakenly under the impression that God had somehow changed. That God was not just a God who uh, allows his people to experience his trials, but God was a God who brings people into temptation. That God was seeking to corrupt people. That's what some of the readers of this particular epistle were beginning to think. Isn't it the way when things go wrong, we end up blaming God? Lord, why did you allow me to go through this? Why, Lord, did you bring this trouble, this difficulty my way? Why am I suffering like this? Am I not a child of God? Do you not love me? Why are you allowing me to go through this? We begin to blame God. Or at the very least, we begin to question God and to question that somehow How is he involved in this whole process? That's why James brought them back to the truth that God doesn't tempt. That's also why in James 1 verses 5 and 6, uh, James instructs them to ask God for wisdom to deal with their struggles. Why wisdom? In Ephesians 1.17, Paul explains how wisdom can help in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of temptation. Paul says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I'll read that again. Paul says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why? So that you may know him better. The readers, the original readers of James' epistle had lost touch with who God is. Because they lost touch with who God is, because they forgot that Um, He was the God who, um, through his impact, saw them as the best of all in creation. Because they forgot that he was a loving God, that he was a caring God. That yes, he's a God that allows you to go through trials, but only to prove what he already knows. Because they forgot who God really was, they lost their connection to the one who could help them to overcome their temptation and that's why James had to remind them who God is James had to correct their perspective on who God is so that they could once again connect with the one who's able to help them to overcome and this is why Paul says in Ephesians 1 17 that we need the spirit of wisdom and revelation why so that we can know him better How do you resist the devil? Through knowing God. It is through your relationship with God that you will get to know him. I'm sure that there may be many different tried and tested techniques that people may suggest as to how you overcome temptation. 
Some people may think, okay, we, we need to adopt the uh, Joseph method of dealing with temptation. When Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife, Joseph up and ran and left. He didn't want to stay in that place of temptation. What does that mean? That every time we are tempted, we up and run. What if that temptation were to take place in your place of work? What if that temptation were to take place even in your own household? Can you up and run? Can you up and walk away? I want to suggest to you right now that the most important thing, the key thing which will hold you, the key anchor which will hold you is Jesus Christ through his spirit in your life. If God is present in your life, you have someone to focus on, someone to take your gaze off of the temptations of this world. I have found in my own life that the times at which I am most susceptible to temptation is if I have not spent enough time alone with God. If I have not connected with God, if I have not really uh, focus my attention on him, if I have not given him the worship that he deserves. The moment I take my eyes off of God, my mind starts to create different thoughts about who God is. I get a warped perspective of who God is, and I begin to drift away from him. And when I drift away from him, that's when the enemy seizes his opportunity to throw enticement. And there's nothing within me to battle those thoughts. It is only as I remain in his presence. It is only as I begin to uh, really focus on who God is and allow him to fill my thoughts and my mind and my heart that I find the strength to resist. Now, I, I just felt led before our service started. These are offering baskets. I'm not about to ask for an offering but I need you to visualize these things. Because just before uh, coming up, I just felt God saying something to me. I felt God saying to me that today I want to strip away from you all that causes you to be enticed. And I want to fill that gap in your heart which was once filled with the desires to sin. That's what I sense God wants to do. The desire to sin is like rubbish. And that's why I've picked up these three, three baskets because to me, just imagine for a moment, they're not offering baskets, they are rubbish baskets. I want you to picture right now these baskets as a place where if you are able to leave your desires there, if you are able to say, Lord, I need you to take this from me, because your word tells me that you will not give me more than I can bear, that you will provide a means of escape, you will provide a way that I can stand up under it. If you can visualize those things which have corrupted you, those things which have held you back, those things which have held you down, those things which make you feel as if God is not there, and if you can put them in the basket, I sense God saying, listen, I want to fill the space where there is a void in your life. I want to fill that space with my presence. I just want to ask the worship team just to come. Galatians 5.16 says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the spirit, what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Live by the spirit. 
The Spirit, needs to, the Spirit of God needs to fill the void in your heart to take the space, to take control so that those desires cannot grow up, cannot master you, cannot control the way you think, you feel, you act. The Spirit of God wants to come and do something amazing with you today. You know, it's interesting that Pastor Peter was sharing with us. He was uh, referring to uh, Acts chapter 2, the outpouring of the Spirit. Because with the outpouring of the Spirit, it says that the Holy Spirit came down even as tongues of fire on those who were praying. And as tongues of fire came and rested on those who were praying, they were filled with the Spirit. Now when that fire came down on them, it didn't burn them. But it was like fire. It was symbolic of the fact that there was a burning taking place. There was a new passion for God that was there. There was a power right now. There was a power to uh, do what God can only do, to flow with God. But I want to suggest to you that not only was there a new passion, not only was there a new desire, a new zeal to serve God, but there was also a burning taking place in their hearts. A burning of the things that corrupted them. A burning of the things that held them down, that held them back. Today I believe the Lord is saying to you, even this day, that if you will stand in his presence, he will put his spirit in you and he will cause his spirit even to empower you, to enable you, to be a witness for him, to shine his light into a dark world. But at the same time, I believe that the Spirit will displace the power and the mastering of those sinful desires which have controlled the way that you think, the way that you feel, the way that you act. Today, if you sense the Lord saying to you, Listen, you need to respond to this. I just want you just to stand right now to your feet. Right now, it's a time for us to allow the Spirit of God to come and to descend on us, to empower us, to be all that God intends us to be. And the only way to do that is to burn up the fuel of our sinful desires. Every one of us is sinful. Every one of us has sinful desires. Every one of us can at any point be enticed by the enemy. But the one thing that will protect us is if we know our God and if the Spirit of God is alive and within us and strong and powerful and able to fend off what the enemy is trying to do. Today is a day if you want the Lord just to come and fill your heart, just stand with me. Holy Spirit, rain down. I just want to ask you right now just to come forward.
you need to do business with God, if you're standing right now, if you just want the Spirit of God just to come and fill you, to empower you, to fill the space where the enemy is really and really getting at you, where he's using the desires within your heart. Let's just be open right now to what the Spirit of God is doing in this place. I don't know about you, but I want the light of God within my heart to be bright. And I don't want the enemy to have victory over the way I live, over the way I think, over the way I feel, over the things I say, over the things I do. I don't want the enemy to have victory over me. And I want the Spirit of God just to come and just to consume. He needs the fuel of my own weaknesses and struggles just to begin to cause me to be set ablaze. Where you're standing right now, I just want you just to begin to just confess to God. Just confess those areas of weakness, those desires within your own heart. You know them right now. Lord, I just pray, would you just reveal to us, Lord, as we are standing here before you, would you just reveal to us those areas of weakness, those areas, Lord Jesus, where we have sinful desires, Lord, that, um, that, are, that are just ripe and ready for the enemy just to come and just uh, manipulate us. Lord, we just pray right now, show us those areas of weakness. And as you picture these baskets in front, I just want you just to, in your mind, just begin to throw those areas of weakness into that basket. This is not what God has intended for you. Your struggle is not what God has intended for you. The way you've been thinking is not what God has intended for you. Some of you right now, you're here this morning and you are tempted. You are constantly tempted to take over, to take control, to not allow God to do what only God can do because you want to be in charge. And the Lord is saying even today, you need to allow him to take control. Don't give in to the desire to run your own life, but allow God to lead you. Some of you, you're here this morning and you are tempted. Your heart just goes out to the things that you can accumulate for yourself. Because you think that those things give you status. Those things somehow shape who you are. But the Lord is saying to you even today that the only status that you need to concern yourself is whether you are my child. Is whether you are a son or a daughter of the one true living God. Some of you, you are here, you are tempted You are tempted to do your own thing because you doubt God. Because of past struggles with faith. It's like you feel that God has let you down. He's not answered your prayers and therefore you struggle to allow God to take complete control. But I just sense the Lord is saying that if you will open up your heart, if you will allow my spirit to come and to fill your heart even today, then I'm going to remove your doubts. I'm going to remove your doubts. And I'm going to pour into you my spirit. who's going to do exceedingly abundantly far more than you can ever ask or think. Lord Jesus, I just want to pray for your people standing here today. 
Lord, I just pray, would you by your spirit just now, just raise your hands, raise your hands. Lord, would you by your spirit just begin to fill your people here today. Lord, they are confessing before you. They're confessing areas of their lives, areas of their hearts, desires that they have which are not right. And Lord, I just want to pray by your spirit that, Lord, you're just going to fill them. Holy Spirit, would you come right now? Would you come right now in the name of Jesus? In the name of Jesus. Pastor Peter. Well, God is a holy God and He jealously guards over each one of you because you are holy because you are all precious to Him and uh, today's word from Pastor Colin was that do not let sin grow up in your heart do not let it take control become matured in you instead you are to mature you become full grown yourself to take responsibility of your life rather than let temptation and sin take over you that you have to take responsibility in your life to grow up to grow up and the Spirit of God says I will help you to grow up I'll help you to grow up all right this is you have to become a soldier is to grow up and take responsibility of your life do not yield yourself and let sin take responsibility and, and grow you instead because that will lead you to death but if you follow God God will bring you to life hallelujah so father we just pray holy spirit come and sweep over lord your people holy spirit come and fill your people in the name of jesus as we command or as we evict every temptation yes. and enticement they have lodged yes. in the heart of your people that in jesus name we break those holes those grips in your life to get out in jesus name yes so that the spirit of god just could come and fill you and the blood of Jesus cleanse each one of us. Cleanse each one of us. Cleanse each one of us. And that our minds be cleansed, renewed, so that we know the hope that God has called us, the power that is at work inside each one of us, and the immeasurable and the riches in the inheritance in Christ Jesus. So, Father, we pray that we are sons and daughters that live and walk, Lord, in that inheritance that you have for each one of us. We are not going to be a slave to sin, but we are a son of righteousness. Hallelujah. So realize your status, brothers and sisters. Realize your standing in God. Hallelujah. We have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. So let's not go back to the works of darkness. Let's not be seduced by the darkness again because it's not compatible in our lives. We are the children of light. We are to shine as light. So tell yourself, I'm not going to let sin to grow up in my life. I will grow up with the help of the Holy Spirit to deal and to resist sin because I'm called to be holy. I'm called yes. to be a child of God. Hallelujah. Yes. So Father, we just thank you and seal your good word, your living word. As uh, later on in, the, in uh, chapter 1, the word of truth that brings life. Seal it, Lord, into our hearts, we pray. Fill us with the Holy Spirit and help us as we walk. Lord, in faith, Lord, we're going to realize that there is a power of the Holy Spirit that's at work in us. Hallelujah. That we can have, uh, we can live, Lord, uh, lives that are fruit, that, that is fruitful to give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're just going to pray real quick. Um, we're going to walk along. We're just going to touch and just lay hands. I just sense God saying that we need to do this. And uh, we're not going to spend long with you, but I just believe that the Lord is saying, as we have received, so we must pass on.
Holy Spirit Let's all stand. Yeah. Well, we believe the Holy Spirit fills us. He's your comforter, he's your counselor. He's the one who gives you power. The Lord is our inheritance, he's your inheritance. Okay, he's walking with you. 
and the Lord is with, the, with us all the time. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Just acknowledge God in your daily work and you will experience that he will, talk, he will speak to you. He will give you insight. He will give you power. give you anointing. God is like this jar that's tilting, you know, just waiting to pour into you. Just pour into your life. Lord, we thank you for today's word. That we will hide your word in our hearts. That we will not sin against you. Lord, we will not allow temptation. Lord, to, uh, to, to give birth and our desire to give birth to sin. Because we will not allow it, Lord, to take control of our lives. Because you have called us to be strong. So we thank you, the Lord, for enabling each one of us to be strong as a soldier of Jesus Christ. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all and strengthen us this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless. Have a great week ahead. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. I know I have seen, I know you have heard.